everybody, and welcome to the Thursday, October 19, 2017, in our series about the rise of commercial space businesses in Asia. And I'm delighted uh, to be able to welcome Dr. Yuya Nakamura, the president and CEO of Axel Space to uh, speak for us today. We're also very happy to welcome the public. These series, this series is produced by the US Asia Technology Management Center, and I'm Richard Dasher. I direct the center, and I'm hosting the series. So Dr. Nakamura earned his PhD in um, aerospace engineering from the University of Tokyo in 2007. While he was there, in the Intelligent Space Systems Laboratory, he was involved in three microsatellite projects, including the world's first successful CubeSat uh, that was launched in 2003. The CubeSat is a standardized microsatellite of 10 centimeters cubic size. So he has a great background for this. Based on what he did in the university, he founded Axel Space in 2008 and uh, has started a private microsatellite project for Weather News, which is the world's largest weather information company. And he has led three microsatellite projects so far and is going also to tell us about a project that is in development in the middle of... Uh, maybe business development called Axel Globe, because I think the launches are ready to go if they haven't already started. Anyway, we're delighted that Dr. Nakamura can join us today at Stanford and look forward to your comments. So um, good afternoon, uh, everyone. My name is Yuya Nakamura, the president and CEO of Axel Space, um, as Dr. Dasher introduced. Um, it's a great honor for me to be here to speak about uh, my company and a little bit about the, the current situation of Japanese uh, commercial space business. And well, um, I'd like to ask for some generosity about uh, to accept uh, my unnatural or how can I say unsophisticated expression that I might make. So, um, well, in fact, the presentation my. Uh, the title of my presentation was suggested by Dr. Dasher. I will thank you very much for that. It is, uh, I really appreciate it. So first, uh, I will uh, show you the brief introduction of myself. And I was born in uh, 1979. I'm now uh, 37 years old. Maybe uh, some of you may think that I'm a space fan, but I was not. Um, I was just a chemistry guy when I was a high school student. I loved the organic chemistry. And you know, I took um, an entrance exam at the Faculty of the Chemistry at Waseda University, uh, located in Tokyo, besides the University of Tokyo. And you know, when I started learning chemistry at the university, I lost interest in the chemistry uh, because of the you know, horrible wave equation. <laughs> So, uh, you know, the, there are the first two years at the University of Tokyo are dedicated to liberal arts, so we can switch to a different faculty. So, and uh, by coincidence, I met the professor at the Faculty of Aerospace Engineering trying to, uh, to start a new project about the student satellite. So I was so fascinated about uh, his plan, and I uh, decided to go to uh, his lab and I got involved in three nano, nano and micro satellite projects started in 2000. And uh, while I was a university student, I was um, getting involved in uh, three satellite projects. And I, when I graduated, I wanted to continue developing micro satellite as my job. However, um, I couldn't find any company doing such business. So I made up my mind to start my own company together with my colleagues. So um, that is Axel Space, and this is uh, the latest satellite of ours, uh, which was launched uh, July this year, three months ago. And the size is uh, uh, 50 centimeters on the side, the weight is about uh, 50 kilograms. And this is our team and our office. We have now um, 42 people, and 29 are engineers, 
And we are getting uh, more and more international, and 12 members are from outside Japan. And uh, uh, they come from various countries, including the US, UK, uh, the Spain, France, Italy, Poland, Malaysia, India, and so on. So our standard uh, language is Japanese and English. So we, we use both languages at our office. So um, we are now rapidly growing, and we divided our group into four. Uh, four group, different groups. The main one is Spacecraft Design Group, SDG, SDG in short. This is our main functionality in our company. Uh, this group is making the satellite hardware and software, and 80 members are in this group. And this is a new a group, Space Business Intelligence Group. We call it SBIG. And this group takes charge and uh, developing the operational software of the uh, satellites, and the image analysis. You know, um, uh, I, I will describe it later. We are trying to, uh, to analyze the image from a satellite to extract some useful information to deliver that to end users. So uh, this SBIG is trying to achieve that function. And uh, we have the business develop development and sales group and uh, business administration group, which is in charge of uh, back office. So uh, here, I want to get back to my university days, why I started to develop uh, satellites. Let me show you my you know, first you know, product. This is the satellite. We call it a CANSAT. It's so small, but it doesn't go to space in real. Um, this is a kind of an experimental ex experiment and a demonstration satellite. And we, but we really launched into the sky, not in space. We use this small rocket, model rocket, and we made a various experiments in the Black Rock Desert, uh, located in Nevada. And I will show you how this project goes. And we launch our satellite up to four kilometers high using the, that small rocket. And after the release from the rocket, the, uh, the satellite deploys the parachute. And they are doing various experiments while descending to the, uh, uh, the ground. It's about uh, 15 to 20 minutes. We will do a lot of experiments like uh, taking a photo of the desert or trying to control the attitude and so on. And so this is the structure of our CANSAT, and we put three CANSATs in, a, uh, in a, you know, the rocket tube, and a close with a fairing, and attached to the launch pad, and we launch it. And you can see uh, hundreds of launches when you go to this experiment, it's so exciting. But you know, uh, these rockets are operated by the rich people, in the US. <laughs> so they just enjoying the launch of the satellite. So they start drinking after the launch. But we are satellite guys, so we start you know, uh, everything from the launch. So uh, the beer, drinking beer guys, and we are you know, uh, trying to operate satellite guys. So we have to uh, track the satellite using the, our Yagi antenna. So this is a very you know, uh, exciting and difficult moment for us whether if we can really catch the signal from the satellite. And we accumulated uh, various experience um, through this project, and we really moved to our uh, project, satellite project going to space. And this is a CubeSat. Uh, there is no reference of the size, but the size is 10 centimeters on the side. The weight is just one kilogram. And this satellite was the world's smallest satellite at that time. And we made the satellite at the university. And you know, uh, the universities, Japanese universities don't have much money, so we have to manage to you know, lower the cost as much as possible. So we purchased uh, many parts from the DIY store to set up our own, the clean booth. And this is how we make the satellite. And you see how small the satellite is. And this is the uh, picture uh, taken just before the launch, it was in Russia, and the, the satellite was launched in 2003, and using the Russian rocket. 
And uh, this launch uh, included several CubeSats from various com uh, countries, including Japan, the US, and Denmark, maybe. And only two satellites from Japan were successful in this CubeSat. And uh, our CubeSat was successful at uh, acquiring a lot of images on board the satellite. And it was you know, uh, quite exciting. We used the uh, commercial on the shelf uh, cut parts to lower the cost. But no one in JAXA, Japanese Space Agency, believed that it would work in space. Because they have used the space-rated product, uh, products only. But we proved that even the commercial of the shelf parts would work in space. So based on this experience, so we started to, uh, to try more you know, uh, challenging uh, project. At the same time, the universities around the world started their own nanosatellite or microsatellite projects. I heard that in two or three years, more than hundreds of universities uh, had their own microsatellite project. So while I was at university, I experienced three and microsatellite project. And at the same time, the Thai, uh, Tokyo Institute of Technology made another three satellites. And Axel Space was founded by the graduate uh, from these two uh, universities. So we have experienced six uh, successful microsatellites in total. And um, you know, the microsatellite, microsatellite was just an educational tool when I started this type of you know, student satellite project. But uh, as we make more and more satellites, it became our practical tool in the society. So we wanted to uh, make a really um, you know, useful satellite for someone in the society. So I decided to start a company. So now I get back to the, uh, the present days. So when I think about how good the, the microsatellite is, Let's compare the satellite, microsatellite with the conventional large satellite. You know, it's very small, which means it's very simple. So it can be developed in a short period, like one year, or maybe two years. So of course, we can reduce the cost. It's just 1% of the conventional large satellites. You may think that it's still too expensive to have one microsatellite, it's $5 million. But think like this, um, the price is almost the same as that of the helicopter. And you may imagine that many private companies have their own uh, helicopters. So this means that uh, even private companies have their own satellites for their businesses. And yes, we had a customer. It's Weather News. It's a Japanese uh, private company. And I believe that uh, it's the world's largest weather information company. But they don't use our satellite for weather forecasts. They want to monitor icebergs in the Arctic Ocean. You know, due to the global warming, ice in that region is melting rapidly, and new shipping route is emerging. And shipping companies are eager to use that new route because, as you see, the, uh, we call it the Northern Sea Route. The Northern Sea Route will allow us to shorten the voyage distance drastically. It's just two thirds of the conventional routes, which will reduce the fuel cost, labor cost, and so on. So they can save a lot of money. But it's very dangerous without any safety information when sailing that area because uh, many you know, icebergs are floating around. So, uh, Weather News is trying to provide such kind of you know, navigation services to shipping companies using uh, the data from our satellite. But some of you may think that they can purchase the images from the existing satellite. That's true. But as I said, this, those images are from the existing conventional you know, big satellites, which is very expensive. And the satellite imagery is also expensive. Do you know how much does it, it, it costs? Well, it, uh, it depends, but uh, normally speaking, it's about um, $10,000 per image. And they need 
uh, more than you know, dozens of you know, uh, photos to provide such kind of services. And they found it difficult to make it a business if they use the conventional images. So they decided to own their satellite. Of course, it costs several million dollars. But they don't need to pay for every image they take. So um, uh, that's how they decided to uh, have their own satellite. So far, we have developed three microsatellites. And two of them are for weather news. The an another one is, uh, the second one, is a kind of a demonstration satellite uh, developed uh, together with the University of Tokyo. I will describe it later. And based on these uh, experiences, we won the contract from JAXA about developing their satellite. They launched the Innovative Satellite Technology Demonstration Program last year, and we won the contract. We are now developing the satellite, and we are launching it at the end of next year using the Japanese Epsilon rocket. And this is, I think this is, um, um, epoch making in the Japanese space uh, development his, uh, history because you know for 30 to 40 years of the space development uh, history they you know ordered the satellite to only two companies in Japan like NEC and Mitsubishi Electric and they made the JAXA satellite in turn but um, this time they uh, allowed us to make their satellite so I think um, this is a kind of a new uh, era of the space, uh, Japanese space uh, development. Okay, let me show you some you know, achievement of our second satellite, Hodoyoshi-1. This uh, project was funded by the Japanese government, so uh, I can show you, the, you know, some images from the satellite. We have taken more than uh, uh, 3,500 photos so far, and this is the uh, Argentina, and this is maybe the, I forgot where it is, but uh, Madagascar, maybe the Muddy River. So it's, it's surprising, it looks red. It's, it's because of the mud. And this is Dubai, you know, and San Francisco. You can see uh, vessels, <laughs> right, sailing in the San Francisco Bay. And, uh, you know, we're, and uploading new images every week on a website. So if we have time, so please check our website, uh, excelglobe.com. Uh, we are updating those images every Friday. Of course, our satellite is, is for Earth monitoring, Earth observation, but we're trying, we're trying another thing. Let me show you some. Uh, this is moon. It looks simple, but it's very difficult to achieve that. Because you know uh, we are using the line type uh, sensor. I mean, it's scanning the ground. But if you want to monitor the moon, you need to scan the moon from the orbit. The satellite is orbiting at the speed of 7.8 kilometers per second. It's so fast, so it's very difficult to uh, control the attitude to track the moon scanning it, right? And we succeeded. And another interesting uh, photo is this. Guess what? Yes, it's an international space station. You know, our satellite is orbiting at the altitude of 500 kilometers. And the ISS, International Space Station, is orbiting at the altitude of 350 kilometers. And the relative speed is about 14 kilometers per second. And if you blink, you miss it. So we need to control the you know, shooting uh, you know, uh, timing very precisely and accurately. And of course, the attitude. So and we were successful at you know, taking the photo of the ISS from our satellite. And uh, the engineers were so excited about this. And some of you may imagine that uh, we have a big operation center like this, but this is not true. So how do we operate our satellites? The answer is this. We developed the software, web application I mean. 
Uh, this is a highly integrated and uh, operation and request uh, management system developed by our uh, engineers. And this, you know, the interface is, looks very simple, but uh, there are so many, you know, complicated tasks running uh, um, you know, around this, you know, uh, system. But you know, the customer, what customer should do to request uh, the capture, the images, is very simple. Just click on the map where they want to take a photo, and they wait for a week. Then the image is ready on the right pane. We also do nothing, just wait. So the, uh, what the system is doing is that after receiving the request from our customers, they are making the operation schedule and making some, you know, the commands to be sent to the satellite and transmit those commands when the satellite is above the ground station. Then they receive the image data from a satellite. Again, the satellite is when the satellite is above the ground station. Then we need to, you know, adjust some images to make it um, the useful product, like the, how can I say, the some uh, correction will be needed. And it's done automatically. And if it's ready, the image is uploaded on the server. The user can download those images from this website. This is so complicated, but we did it in the system. And as I said, we don't need to do anything except some trouble happened. And uh, based on that uh, track record, we, were, we raised $17 million two years ago, mainly from the Japanese venture capital firms and uh, three different uh, Japanese business enterprises like Mitsui and Skyperfect, JSAT, and Weather News. And now we are making the new satellite called Gruus. Uh, which weighs 100 kilograms, it is, which is bigger than the previous satellites. And this is again uh, the Earth observation satellite. But the image quality is much improved uh, from the previous Hodoyoshi 1 satellite. This is a sample image, and the ground resolution is about 2.5 meters, and the SWAS uh, is about 60 kilometers. It's much, much, you know, uh, high quality image than uh, Hodoyoshi 1. Uh, the specification of Hodoyoshi 1 is that the ground resolution is 6.7 meters and the SWAT is about just 28 kilometers. So it's more, you know, fine but wide area. So that's the GRU satellite image. And with this GRU satellite, we started a new project, a new initiative called ExoGlobe. I will start a movie. So let me show you some concept video of this Axel Grow project.
So as you see, um, we are not launching just a single satellite. We are launching 50 microsatellites in total. And we are trying to monitor the whole world. And we are updating those images every day. That's what we're trying to do. So um, you may think that you can see anywhere in the world uh, using the Google Earth. But it's not updated so often. So we want to add the, you know, the new value, I mean, the time axis into the you know, Earth's monitoring industry. So we can track even slight changes, which is happening on the ground with our system. So let me show you some applications uh, which, uh, which can you, be useful when using our system. The first one is precision agriculture. We can see crop growth from, uh, from space. And the farmers want to know the crop growth every um, three days. In that sense, uh, they need to use our constellation, providing data every day. Uh, the forestry is another application. We can easily see the illegal logging activities or damage a tree because of the, you know, the hurricane or typhoon, something like that. And uh, the well system can be used in an urban area as well, like area marketing. You can find the best place for building a new uh, department store in the remote, remote city, maybe in the developing countries, without sending many people to research the whole city. And we can track economic trends, like monitoring, for example, ports. Uh, we can see the, uh, how many cars are exported or imported, for example. And disaster monitoring is the, you know, uh, one of the common applications which uh, Earth monitoring uh, satellites are doing. But in our case, we're monitoring the area every day. So uh, by comparing uh, the images just before the disaster and after the disaster, we can make some, you know, the best evacuation plan or rescue plan. Or in the future, we may be able to uh, predict that the landslide would happen tomorrow. Such kind of, you know, a prediction may be possible. And uh, next, let me show you how AxioGlobe becomes a new generation business. And we want to uh, cons construct a new business platform based on our Access Globe database. So as I said, we are providing the daily monitoring, IRS monitoring database, uh, monitoring platform, and we are providing some APIs so that uh, many players can access the database to extract some data. And our customers uh, are in you know, various uh, industries, and they're accessing our data and they use our data to add some value in their applications or products to provide uh, some service to their end users. So this is the ultimate image of our you know, future business. So I want to create such kind of new uh, kind of an ecosystem uh, of the Earth's uh, monitoring uh, data. And from the viewpoint of the app developers, I mean, the, we call it the players of Axel Group. It's like this. You know, company A is doing business in the agriculture field. They're trying to create uh, some value added application, which would be provided to end users like agriculture cooperatives or large scale farmers. How they do this? It's they, they have to use various types of data, like they may, they may need farm work log, of course, weather data, and soil water quality data. And they can use Axel Globe as well to make a practical application. This is, this is how our business goes. So to realize this type of business, we have to think about how we can provide the data to app developers. The easiest way is just to provide the imagery. But to analyze this imagery, uh, some technical skills are required. So it's, 
it's very you know, difficult for us to request to achieve, you know, to acquire such kind of you know, skills by themselves. So I will try to do to extract some information. I mean, I, I, will, I would like to analyze our data so that the app developers can use it uh, easily. So we have to, uh, to you know, uh, reduce the gap between the imagery and the final product. So what we do is, as I said, analysis. We do analyze the satellite imagery. For example, we can extract some uh, number of cars in each parking from the image of, image of Tokyo. But it is not enough to make an application because, for example, if we find 100 cars in a parking lot, I don't know if it's you know, a big number or small number. So uh, what uh, is important is the interpretation. And we cannot do this because we don't have any, you know, uh, some industry-specific data. It is required to give some interpretation to the anal analyzed data. So that's what app developer would do using our data. Maybe they can get some sales estimate of each store from the, from the number of cars in the parking lot. And based on that data, they can provide service to end users. For example, they, they can evaluate the market share of that user store in that region. So that's why we have to collaborate with application developers in each region, uh, in each industry. As I said, we need to do some analysis of the images. Let me show you some uh, the work we are now doing. So this is a simple one, NDVI analysis. We can see crop growth by this analysis. So what is NDVI? No, I forgot the, what the abbreviation is. It's a kind of a index, the okay. vegetation index. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you can see the green uh, area, uh, and green area, the, what can I say? We see the, the maybe the protein containment in the uh, vegetable, uh, in the uh, crop. So we can uh, indicate um, when to harvest, or you know, other information can be provided to farmers. And when we apply this technology to uh, the urban area, uh, we can do some interesting thing. This is Tokyo image, and uh, you know, this is this shows that uh, how green each town is in Tokyo, and. And this uh, type of data is very you know, useful for municipal government and real estate companies. You know, uh, the many you know, staff is working around the city to, to find how green it is, but we can do that only from a single image from the satellite. It's much cheaper. And this is the uh, traditional uh, one of the traditional you know, remote sensing applications, we can classify the land uh, cover, land usage, like the forest or the farmland, urban area, uh, and we can detect, you know, distinguish clouds from the ice, which is normally difficult because both are white. So we are using deep learning technology to you know, I classify such kind of, you know, uh, similar uh, objects on the ground. And, you know, uh, we're trying to, uh, to learn a lot more to uh, have to, you know, achieve a higher level of classification in the future so that, for example, uh, in urban applications, we can, we may be able to distinguish, distinguish some hospitals, schools, or other, you know, specific uh, buildings from other uh, buildings. So such a kind of application would be useful in a, you know, different, uh, you know, uh, industry. And another example is a building extraction, a building and a road ex extraction. And this means that we can generate, automatically generate maps. It would be useful in developing countries without maps. And as I, you know, uh, we are taking the same area every day so we can uh, find the you know, small changes 
using them using this uh, system. So uh, it's very useful when disaster happens, or um, I don't know, but many uh, infrastructure um, companies are trying to find the difference, like the maybe the construction is going on or other, you know, I don't know, but they want to find such kind of, you know, um, abnormal uh, things as soon as possible. So I think our system would help that. And we can automatically, you know, uh, detect vessels in the water. And it's important for national security. And we may be able to find illegal fishing. And nowadays, um, many you know, users are using AIS signal, which is emitted from the, uh, the ships, the vessels, to space. Oh, not, 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 you know, it's specifically for you know, the sending signals to the port or other ships, but uh, a few years ago, uh, someone found that the, the low signal can be acquired even in space, so they are now using those uh, signals to detect ships in the water, but uh, some ships, some vessels, are intentionally you know, stopping sending signals. You know, uh, if we use our system, we can detect that. So using our you know, visual data, the uh, optical data, and the AIS data, we can detect some you know, suspicious uh, vessels, which is important for the, uh, the government. And another example that uh, we can calculate the coral reef area. Um, this is interesting, you know, the, we, our satellite has an infrared sensor, and infrared uh, cannot penetrate into the water, so we can easily extract the coral reef, and it's very important information for our environment protecting organization or the government. So this is an uh, example of what we do to, an to analyze uh, the data from satellite. And we have been collaborating with many you know, blue chip companies and research institutes in Japan, like JAXA or AIST is a research institute, uh, mainly in the field of <clears throat> AI. And other uh, companies are, you know, uh, have some you know, interest in using our data for their businesses. Even before we launched the first generation satellites, we started uh, some you know, experiment using the data from Hodoyoshi One or other satellites. So we plan to launch the first three satellites next year. This is kind of a pilot project. We're trying to show how uh, capable our satellites are. And by 2022, we plan to complete the 50 satellite constellation to to realize the daily entire Earth monitoring uh, platform. So um, I want to uh, point out some uniqueness of Axiglobe as you know, uh, many other companies are trying to launch hundreds of satellites to monitor the Earth. So what is the difference? So um, I described that the ground resolution is about 2.5 meters, not one meter. Many uh, players are trying to achieve one meter or better resolution. Everyone thinks that the you know, better resolution would be great, but I don't think so. Because uh, I, will, uh, I will show you the reason later. So our focus is not on the higher resolution, but on the, the global coverage. So in that sense, uh, we don't need to accept any capture requests from our customers because we are taking everywhere. Where a customer wants to take a picture, we have it. We can provide that to the customer. So that's what we are trying to achieve. And I will show you why 2.5 meters. If we try to pursue one meter resolution, there are several problems. You know, it's like zooming, right? So only the small area can be covered with a single satellite. So if we want to cover the whole globe, you will need a lot more you know, satellites, like 200, 300, I don't know, but we want to lower the cost as much as possible. 
to maintain this uh, platform. So uh, it's not good when you know, pursuing the global coverage. And of course, the higher resolution images are very important when thinking about the national security purposes. But except that, we have to compete with drones, right? So it's very tough competition. And we have to care about the regulatory issues when we sell the high, high you know, uh, resolution ground images to uh, end users. And this is the most important point, that this is already a red ocean. You can see many players, in, mainly in the US, to, trying to provide the one meter resolution images using CubeSat, it's low cost. So it's you know, nothing for us to enter this market. So that's why we avoided to one meter resolution. So why not five meters? If we, you know, uh, five meter resolution is not enough for urban applications. We have this Hodoyoshi One satellite, whose uh, ground resolution is about uh, six point seven meters. It's very difficult to make analysis in an urban area like Tokyo. But you know, uh, the our customers are on the earth, right? And the main customers are in urban area. area. So urban application will be a cash cow, right? So that's why we crucially you know, need an urban area analysis. So five meter is not enough. Another problem is that the competition against the government operated satellites like Landsat, Sentinel, they are providing 10 meter resolution images for free. So how can we survive in that situation? It's very difficult. So that's why we chose 2.5 meters as a target resolution. We call it the mid middle resolution, and few, few, few players are providing such middle uh, ground resolution images. And there were many more uh, players in the past, but they're trying to achieve you know, more a better resolution. They're going you know, um, to higher resolution, but why? You know, 2.5 meter resolution has to be provided at a lower cost. And traditional players has uh, a kind of a very, you know, the um, unsophisticated you know, operation system. The, they need operators, many operators, to operate the satellite, to download the data, to analyze the data. So the cost is not competitive. But uh, in our case, as I show you uh, in the, you know, the previous slides, uh, we developed the fully automated the operation software. And it, it can be applied to our uh, Axiogrill platform as well. So we can lower the operation cost as much as possible. So I think we can be competitive in this field. So the second uh, uniqueness point, unique point of Axel Globe is that, uh, what's that, uh, potentiality for various applications. So um, there are several you know, other competitors trying to provide the uh, middle resolution images using CubeSat, but uh, we tried to provide a professional quality images. You see, you see that we have a large aperture telescope and so our data has, uh, I can say the potential data inclu is included in our you know, data. So, and another uh, unique point is that, you know, we put all 50 satellites into a single orbital plane. This is really unique. Other computers are trying to, uh, you know, uh, put as many satellites as early as possible. So they are using various orbits, like ISS, or Inter uh, Space Station Orbit, Apollo Orbit. But uh, as you saw in the movie, we are using just a single uh, orbital plane, which enables us to monitor the same place at the same time. All the photos are taken at 10.30 AM, 
which is very important when we use machines to analyze those data. Because if we have one image in 10 a.m., the other image in 4 p.m., of course, it's easy for us to compare two images. But for machines, it's difficult because, for example, think about the direction of the shadow, right? The light condition is also different. But machine doesn't know that, right? So we want to extract only you know, meaningful data from our images. It's very difficult for machines to do so. Um, so we want to provide the high quality, I mean the unified quality data for all, uh, you know, the entire Earth data. And uh, we're trying to pro provide uh, different levels of product. You know, the, depending on the customers, their requirement is different. Um, for end users, they just want the, some text data. I mean, including some useful information for them. For application developers, they may need the imagery. Or uh, the traditional users like the government, they just want the images because they have skills for the, analy uh, the analysis of satellite imagery. So we can uh, provide each of the customers. So uh, that's the uniqueness of our uh, Access World project. So uh, lastly, I will show you some situation of new space in Japan. Uh, th that, that is the end of our you know, uh, company introduction. So now we have, I think, you know, uh, 20 startups in Japan. It's relatively small. I heard that the hundreds of startups exist in, here in the US. But you know, the number is increasing rapidly as you know, more and more people are having some interest in the space uh, industry. The, such people include potential users and investors and the government. But the interesting point in Japan is that there are a little competition among the start startups. Each company is doing, uh, doing business in a different field. And many have a unique selling points and uh, they seek for global expansion in the future. Let me show you some, uh, you know, the famous uh, Japanese space startups. Exospace, iSpace, I think, you know, uh, last, last week. week there was a presentation and they are making the Runa Lover. NASA scale is next trying, uh, next week? Uh, not next week, but later. Later, okay. Yeah. They're trying to, uh, to reduce the debris, space debris. And PD Aerospace, they're trying to make our, how can I say, the space plane. And IST is making our, the, the small rocket, you know, dedicated to the small satellite operators like us. And AO, AO is an interesting company. Um, they're trying to, uh, to realize the uh, artificial shooting star. <laughs> It's so funny, you know, uh, they're trying to uh, launch, they, they are, they're launching, you know, the small satellites uh, and many small metal balls are on board the satellite and they're, you know, uh, shooting the small metal ball from the satellite and when the balls enter the atmosphere, they will burn up and emit some lights and you can see that from the ground. So that's what uh, they're going to uh, realize. And they're saying that they want to use that for the opening ceremony at Tokyo Olympic Games 2020. And uh, Infostella, uh, this is uh, not a satellite company, they are ground station companies. They are trying to uh, connect the many ground stations so that we can easily access the satellite you know, more frequently. They are saying that uh, it's like sharing economy in space. And this company is you know, emerging in you know, uh, various locations in the world. And the, uh, another point is the government, Japanese government, is now uh, trying to support space startups like us in, you know, uh, from the various aspects. 
example, the regulation, they have uh, made two important uh, acts uh, last year, maybe last year. And it's very important because there were no regulations about our you know, activities. So there were, you know, the investors see some risks if you know, there, there is no regulation. So now uh, you know, such kind of you know, uh, regulatory issues are solved and it's you know, all free for us to do business in this field. And they made a new policy. They announced the Space Industry Vision 2030. And they're trying to support startups as much as possible. And finance. And they told this in the Space Industry Vision 2030 that the government affiliated financial institution, institu institutions are ready to supply risk money to startups. You know, the, it's so hard to raise a big money in Japan. You know, it, we raised $70 million two years ago. It was really, uh, you know, a big news in Japan because $70 million in Series A, it's very huge in Japan. It's, I, 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 you know, I am aware that it's common here in the US, but the Japanese uh, VCs have, you know, uh, traditionally invested in only in IT startups. So the maximum amount was around one million or so. But you know, uh, it's changing rapidly. And technology, you know, JAXA and other research institutes are now, you know, um, getting it more and more um, motivation to collaborate with uh, space startups. So one example is that we won the contract from uh, them to make their satellite. Okay. So uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your listening. So we've got some time for questions. I'd like to ask one or two to start. So um, Axel Globe is, has got to be a huge capital outlay, right? Are you going to do it as, as sort of a public-private partnership with the government, or are you going to raise money privately for it? Thank you for your question. Uh, currently, we, we are uh, trying to raise funds in the private sector. And we are now, we just started to talk with the, the venture capitals. And uh, the, pro, you know, the, the amount to be, to, we should raise is very huge in the next round. Uh, it's about, uh, I don't know, five, 50 to 100, right? So it may be difficult uh, to raise money only in Japan. So we are trying to contact the VCs or you know, uh, finance institute in other countries as well. Well, you have a great track record so far, and getting this contract from uh, JAXA, when for 40 years they've only contracted with two of the very big Japanese, uh, you know, high-tech companies, uh, that's pretty impressive. As you grow this way, are you starting? Does it worry you that you might be becoming more like those big companies in regard to the kinds of satellites that you're developing and how they would approach things? You know, we've had projects here like Iridium that was for communication, but it was a huge project. Uh, I think Motorola originally originated it. Uh, did Google finish it? I forget. But in any case, uh, you're in a space that's really unusual for a startup company. Okay, thank you. So we want, we don't want to lose our strengths. We're a small satellite company, so um, our satellite is getting bigger and bigger. But uh, I think the limit is 100 or 200 kilograms. So we don't want to um, uh, to pursue the government uh, funded a huge project. It's difficult for us to do. We have to be flexible uh, because we, now we are focusing on Axel Group, but at the same time, we are doing some uh, dedicated satellite business, mm -hmm. like the weather news satellite. But I think you know, that business would be a small portion of, uh, as a whole uh, when thinking about the whole uh, business. Okay, hmm. let's open the floor. Questions? Back in the back. Okay, given the 
sweet spot for the imaging is two and a half meters. Uh, how do you retain the ability in the planets right now, which has both uh, one, two meters and more than two and a half meters resolution? Okay, so. Um, your question is how do we differentiate uh, ourselves from the planet, right? Okay. So I think, you know, the, the biggest difference is, I believe, the quality. You know, the planet is using CubeSat, right, uh, to acquire the images from satellite. They have already launched more than 100 satellites, so um, they already started business. But um, I heard, uh, you know, many uh, complaints from uh, the the image distributors. I mean, the traditional users of satellite imagery, and you know, the data quality. I think it's crucial in the future because, as I said, and as written in this slide, you know, the data amount will be huge. If we complete 50 satellite constellation, the data amount would be seven to eight petabytes a year. It's almost impossible for us to analyze with a human eye, right? So we have to, we have to use the deep learning to extract some information based on the customer needs. When thinking about uh, that future, the image quality is crucial because the such you know kind kind of you know high quality images would provide more information potentially right so um, I think that would be the differentiation point from the planet. Just a brief comment about that. So you see the the differentiation is not only in the image capture; it's in the image analysis. So uh, yep. you may find that you're increasingly a software company after all. Thank you very much. That's a good point. Actually, um, at first, we were just a hardware company. We were just making satellites. But as we grow and as we um, make extra real project, we have to shift to a software company. Of course, we, 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 you know, we have to we, we, you know, keep the capability of building satellites. It, it's, I think it's a very most important point when doing business. But uh, we have to provide a service to our customers, not only images itself. So that's why we created the SBIG, Space Business Intelligence Group, which are in charge of such kind of, you know, the work. So okay. we're, we're making the, you know, uh, doing such kind of things. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> Are so the first was about video. video. Are you going to do video, video. capture? The second one, I couldn't find it. Is all the IP here being specific of satellites now that are using the RFI and you are more playful? Lasers. Lasers for down, or down linking. The so the one. first was video. A video, okay. Well, um, actually, uh, we are thinking of that. Uh, the first, for the first generation satellites, we don't have such ca capabilities, but I heard some news about the video, the movie. So uh, we are thinking of implementing such functionality in our second generation satellites. Maybe which will be launched, uh, will be launched in, I don't know, 2020 or so. And of course, we're you know, uh, we have some interest in our laser communication because it's getting more and more difficult to, to get new frequencies when uh, you know, communi communicating with ground stations. And so we are now um, uh, talking with uh, some companies doing such kind of you know, laser communication uh, technologies. So that may happen in the future. Back. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, so I have a more general question because I'm not really familiar with the field. So I'm wondering if you're uh, taking pictures of the world or specific areas uh, where there are maybe some uh, military facilities. Do you have to especially be careful with that? 
Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. The question was about um, we need do, do do we need to care about the you know the sensitive area like military base? Yeah. Okay. I will answer the question with this slide. Wait a second. So it's closely related to why we chose 2.5 meters. If we choose one meter resolution, we need to care about such kind of issues. We have to get some permissions from the government to sell the images to end users. But there is a, how can I say, the threshold in two meters, in the case of Japan. If we get uh, two meter or better resolution images, we need to talk to the government when we sell data to some users. But in the case of 2.5 meters, we don't need to get permission from the government. And it's you know, rough enough not to find some military, you know, uh, like, I don't know, military strategy or, I don't know, but, you know, it, uh, the government is, uh, allows us, government allows us to monitor anywhere in the world with 2.5 meter resolution. That's one reason why we chose 2.5 meters. Are there international agreements that allow capture of images regardless of what kind of space? Because I can imagine that there, there are lots of places that are considered larger sensitive areas and, and the resolution doesn't answer all of that. Well, um, officially, there are no such regulations because our satellites are in space and it's not, it doesn't you know, belong to any country. So uh, no one can you know, pose such kind of you know, regulations in, on you know, each satellite. Next question. You mentioned that about the video. Uh, you mentioned the application. So what kind of customer uh, will be interested in use of video image from space? Wow, that's a good question. Uh, what kind of uh, customers would be would be interested in using video? I heard um, some, you know, entertainment company may want to use the video for uh, their business. That's one um, option, and you know, I believe that traffic. But mm, that's a good point. But actually, the point. The point is that our satellite is not a geostationary, yeah. so it's very difficult to track the traffic all the time. Uh, so we can see the same point once a day. So that's a you know a difficult a question to answer. But the I think the the biggest user would be the government. They can use those data for military or national security purposes. So for Axel Space, what does international business development look like for you? Because uh, a lot of these could be done anywhere in the world. Certainly with 50 satellites, you'll have a lot of places. Yes, thank you very much. It's a very important point. Um, now we're talking with many uh, you know, uh, the developing countries about the collaboration of uh, using Axel Globe. They have a strong interest in space uh, business, and you know uh, the the like developed countries like U.S. and the, Japan. Uh, it's a high resolution market. It's very difficult to sell our mid resolution images to uh, users in this market. But in developing countries. The mid-resolution images can be used in a variety of, you know, the industry like agriculture, forestry, you know, mapping, um, urban planning. So they are, they really want to use those data, but the existing images are too expensive for them to purchase many images. So that's why we try to collaborate together with them, and they have a strong interest. And uh, um, if we can collaborate. Uh, we can do a lot, and we are offering that the several satellites can be made in that country, 
they have a strong interest in you know, making some hardware as well. So we can do uh, collaboration in, a, you know, uh, in many points. And uh, I said that we will make 50 satellites, but some uh, satellites out of 50 can be made, can be owned by other countries or even companies, maybe individuals. So it's like the sharing economy, again, in space, you know, that it, if, you, if you want to monitor your country, and you will have a satellite. And of course, you can monitor your area. Um, let's say, if, we have, if, if you have one satellite, you can monitor every, uh, it depends on the orbit, but every week with your satellite. But, you know, um, but, you know uh, uh, other than that, they're doing nothing, right? So if we can collaborate, we can do a lot. The other satellite in the constellation can monitor your area. With 50 satellites, you can, uh, we can monitor every day. And we can provide the data from other satellites. But if you can provide the data out of your area of interest, you know, we can share data. And it's kind of a win-win situation. And we, we try to achieve such kind of you know, uh, thing across the world. And many com countries have some interest. And that's, why, that's what we are trying to do, to expand globally. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And uh, you mentioned that your company wants to be a, a business platform. And uh, the Pacific Panthers will be the maybe uh, application developers. And I want to know that how uh, you trust these uh, application developers to attend your platform, to use your platform. And uh, have you ever tried to do that? How, how do you attract them? Yeah. Okay, got it. Thank you very much. How to attract the app developers to our platform? Okay, yeah, I, that is uh, one of the very difficult, the most difficult things to make such kind of a new platform because there are no users of such kind of you know uh, platform. So what we are doing now is to make a track record. We have to show some examples how to use our data for some specific business. So that's why we try to uh, collaborate with blue chip companies, mainly in Japan, um, to, to, to show everyone the, how can I say, the solid example about utilizing the satellite data. And we need more and more, you know, um, uh, app, app, potential application developers to have some interest in space data. They want as m much data as possible to create, um, you know, uh, the applications. I believe that space data can be one of the, you know, big data source, right? And, you know, uh, these days we don't have such kind of, you know, the big data source because Every, you know, most of the sensors are local, right? But in our case, we are monitoring the whole globe. We can provide the macro data. So both data would be necessary to provide the, how can I say, the correct uh, interpretation to some data. So we believe that space data would be crucial in the near future. So what we have to do now is to create a track record. Uh, before we uh, close off, I want to ask if last comments, if when you got started on the business side of space, is there something you wish that you had known back then that you know now? When you started, uh, you came from the tech side. So what do you wish you had known? Mm. Well, that's a difficult question to answer. You know, I don't have an um, MBA. Uh, what I had was just a passion to make our Microsoft technology as a practical tool in the society. So I think the only 
solution to do so is to create a new business. So I had to learn business. So, um, you know, I, I'm not, uh, as I said, I was not a space fan, and I was not an uh, entrepreneur, actually, but I, <laughs> um, this is just a coincidence. I met Microsoft Lights while I was a university student. I wanted to continue building satellites. That was the only reason to start a company, and I changed myself to <laughs> continue access space as a business. I think that's a great answer. Not only do you change your world, you change this yourself, right? So uh, let's call an end to the session today and go have some refreshments. Thank you, Nakamura-san. Thank you.